sell them what they want, but give them what they need. Welcome back to the With Joey B podcast. We're going to keep talking about extrinsic and intrinsic rewards, drives, motivators, the whole lot. We've done two episodes on it so far, so if you want to get up to speed, you can go back and listen to those. But we're going to power through now. And last episode talked about five downsides of extrinsic uh, rewards, right? Absolutely shitted on the idea of an extrinsic reward as a, as a reason for doing things. Uh, a point I will make is that they're not bad in of themselves, which I try to stress with minimum viable lifestyle, right? These things are, f- are fine. Like I myself plan to make you know, decent money in the future, hopefully. Um, I'll probably elicit praise for my work. I have so far on a very small scale. And I try, sometimes it actually gets to my head, to be honest. Sometimes it's, uh, you kind of get better at dealing with it, just like you do with criticism. Praise and criticism, just two ends of a dangerous spectrum. Let's not get into that, sorry. Stay on topic. You know, they're not, they're not the be-all and end-all even of themselves. At the end of last episode, perfect example, you think about the wealthy people who don't gloat about it because they don't care about money because it doesn't actually provide that much ongoing value if you don't know what you want to spend it on. Sometimes it just makes sense too. If there's no barrier and downside to earning more and it's not creating problems for you because it can create problems, it's just a very useful buffer for your MVO. It's bonus. Uh, as long as bonus is not harmful, and it's not addictive, and it's not something you start to identify with. So they're not bad in and of themselves. But my concern is normally when they're a primary incentive, when they're the things that matter the most. And it's something you can observe. People will never really admit to it um, because it's not fashionable to do so. When they do admit to it, it's without realizing it. So if you need to vet people, and by the way, I might point out, this is really useful to think about when you're hiring people. That's why it's good to figure out people are interested in uh, the thing they're doing. And saying that, I haven't hired necessarily that many people, so I don't think I'm a a recruitment guru, but just uh, observational and my experience. Uh, when, but logically, I just think of it like when people, and I know from auditing myself, when I'm doing something I'm genuinely interested in, it's effortless. I do it for an audience of none. I just need enough pay to pay my bills and I'll probably spend more time doing it than I would a normal job. Uh, people that, you know, dedicated to leave at five o'clock on the dot when you have a job somewhere, it's kind of like that. that's not the most worthwhile thing for you and it's probably not the thing you care about the most, obviously. It'd be nice if work is the thing that you love doing that you wouldn't really measure the time on, per se. So that's just a little point. So extrinsic things, right? So I dumped on them, dumped on them and tore them to shreds in the last episode and that was necessary because kind of like exercise, the problem for most people is not that they... they um, think too negatively about extrinsic drives for most people the problem is that they're not aware enough of them and they're not aware of themselves um coveting them and needing them more than they should and having an unhealthy relationship with them we want to now we've torn apart like a muscle when you work it out kind of tears apart now we want to build the idea back together and that relationship back in a stronger healthier way so we're going to talk about where these extrinsic rewards can be useful And why not start with a very personal and relatable example from Joe's own life? And uh, it's probably good good works with (laughs) marketing and promoting our book. Um, So that book, 18 and Lost, So Were We, that was this kind of, you know, uh, bit bit unusual, different way of doing a book with eight collaborative authors. And it was designed primarily as a learning experience for those authors, of which I and Scott McEwen were, were, were two of those eight. And I guess... We packaged up a project where people weren't really going to, you know, make heaps of money or anything like that or get a clear job title or anything like that. But we used, I guess, part of the allure of that project to kind of game in people into it because what we want people to kind of get access to with the work of that education reform part of our work is nonlinear journeys, right? Things are not so obvious when you're going to get out of them, but it's the first of a thousand doors. They will lead to amazing places, better places, than the linear paths. The difference, the bias with the linear path, you can see where you're going, so you can see the thing you think you want. Uh, supposedly, it has a very direct course to get it. Whereas the non-linear, it's actually, you have to go in this room first, and then from that room, you go through the next doors, and it's the whole thousand doors kind of metaphor analogy from episodes four and five. Sorry, sorry for the audio interruption there. Okay, so now that I've kind of established that, 
and that's why I opened the episode with the quote, sell them what they want, give them what they need, is that, you know, this book wasn't really a financial opportunity for the authors, but it was much more a, it was definitely the opportunity to become an author. And that uh, that idea of becoming an author is normally attractive to most people because it's probably, it's kind of a cool thing. Socially, we think people who are authors are intelligent, respectable, knowledgeable, accomplished. They go and do things. Uh, obviously, it creates opportunities and things like that. Um, it, it can be a gateway and a door opener to so much. But even once you've written the book, the, the fact that you can then call yourself an author uh, is, is kind of cool. Now, becoming an author on its own is not a good reason to write a book. It's like what I said in the last episode about just wanting to do a TED Talk for the sake of doing a TED Talk. You know, it's, it's garbage, all right? You would compromise the message just to tick the box. Really, if you want to become an author, um, the best thing to do is, all right, I want to become an author. It starts off as an extrinsic goal. All right, now, find something I care about more than actually becoming an author to which a book is probably a good tool to do. And then sometimes you actually find something that you care about, like, for example, say, writing about education like we did or, or journeys after school. And you might think, oh, well, the best way to do that might not actually be writing a book. It turns out that that is creating a program, right? But at least you've <laughs> thought about it, not just caught chasing something for an outcome, which we said was one of the downsides of uh, purely primarily focusing on extrinsic rewards. Always find that, that, that meaningful, genuine thing to pursue and all the other things that have extrinsic rewards are normally tools to get the real rewards. And that's, that can be a real good way to diagnose them. So be cautious of what people want. So I guess the idea of <laughs> selling the kind of opportunity to become an author and to learn a lot as well was that, that very direct payoff of I can become an author as opposed to the less tangible payoff of yeah heaps of learning, which was vague. Like, what am I going to learn? How am I going to use it? I know I will learn stuff, but what will enable me to do? I've got all these things I can be doing right now. I guess the, the, there's a little bit of a dose of the extrinsic to get them in there, to get them in the door. And then after they're in the door, um, you know, they kind of get the thing that they need. But they might not even opt into on their own. And it's kind of like, it's kind of the equivalent of like, <laughs> uh, maybe that's not the best example, but when a, you know, maybe a child needs a vaccination, they're scared of needles. It's the thing they need. Oh, great. I picked such a controversial thing. I know a lot of people against vaccinations. Anyway, just take it as a, take it with a grain of salt, guys. I just picked this out of my head. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's the thing they need, that needle. and but, but it's not the thing they want. What they want is to play with their trucks and not go to the doctors, the scary doctors. Now, that doesn't mean we need to force people to do things. That doesn't mean we assume what's best for them. Uh, but th th the point is, the extrinsic, like if you go to the doctor, I'll, get you a lolly, I'll give you a lolly, can be a way of getting people through the important door. So the responsibility of understanding that is to... Be moral about how you do that if you need to. Uh, work out what their interests are before tr supposing to act in them. So it can be useful to helping people get in. But it can't be the whole thing. Because if it's such an alluring extrinsic reward, like you're going to become an author and get a million dollars, then you change the whole dynamic. And that's what I fear a lot of university and uh, formal education has become. It dangles a reward... So you get a lot of people in there for the reward, right? I want to be this prestigious doctor or lawyer or other, insert other profession rather than caring about the absolute thing. But then you start to get this culture of all the people studying are not actually genuinely interested in the thing. And it actually kind of sours a culture for those who are genuine. And it prevents people who are genuine but didn't get as high marks from getting in. So you get all these problems from extrinsic rewards and an over-reliance on them. That's why it's the importance of... Uh, you know, being very responsible and minimalistic with their use. The other, the other thing I think I want to disclaim, so that's one point. The second, I think I would say about, you know, where can extrinsic rewards be useful? It's just where they're very honest and appropriate and measured, right? So paying people for their work, <laughs> right? It's a very simple thing because money can be a tool for identity and, you know, if you feel like you're rich, it's a certain image you get to hold of yourself, 
But also don't forget that money is an everyday tool. People actually need it at the moment until a cryptocurrency or an alternative monetary system crumbles the existing monetary system. I guess if it's still a monetary system, it's still an extrinsic reward, then it's actually useful. It's just in the appropriate dosage. Praise, for example, like excessive praise um, can be very misleading. And it's the whole idea that, you know, but appropriate praise is very useful. So this is, if you ever look into fixed versus growth mindset by Carol Dweck as a field of uh, research, it's so fascinating and powerful for anyone who's interested in this. I can guarantee you'd love her book, Mindset. No affiliation with me. Um, very powerful, the way praise is talked about. That excessive praise just to tell people that they can do things. For It's, it's the whole myth, like... Do you like being told, yeah, you can do anything, listener? If I was to sit here every episode, you can do whatever you want. You can achieve your dreams. You just got to believe and use a thousand doors. If I was going to sit here like talking like that all day, you'd switch off to that message because it's very vague. It's very empty. Like, you know, I know some of you. I don't know all of you, right? How do you know what I'm capable of? But praise is very specific. Like, Joe, I like the, the daily format of the podcast. They're small. Um, so it's easy for me to fit in my day. So you notice how that pres- that praise is specific and honest. But, for example, you bump into the microphone a bit too much in saying that. Um, maybe it's a bit casual. Maybe I don't like the um, the Steve Jobs get-up you wear when I watch your YouTube video. Maybe I don't like the black and white. Um, but, you know, you're headed in the right direction with everything else. And you see how that praise is not not empty praise for the sake of it, but it's specific and it's detailed and it's appropriate, right? And it's... It's obviously not just a reward, but it's also feedback in there. But in that in that framework of fixed versus growth mindset, which I probably won't go into and explain now, it's just very interesting to look at towards the end of that book how she talks about part of the the movement came out fixed versus growth mindset. The growth mindset's kind of better. Spoiler alert. And you know it was praise seemed like an important part of it, so people were just lavishing praise for no reason. And once they find that it's it's very disingenuous. And makes people fatigue, it's counterintuitive, whereas actual dedicated appropriate feedback, because it gives people the information what they need to do to improve, is actually is actually very helpful. So, you know, small doses. And I think I don't want to jump ahead. I think we're going to talk next episode, are we, about, uh, you know, extrinsic traps. So I'm not going to um, overlap with that, but we're going to talk more about, like, the appropriate dosage of extrinsic rewards next relevant for yourself and for other people you deal with and work with and family and, and probably probably young fellas too when you're raising kids, I imagine. But I'm certainly not an expert in that. So I guess don't be ashamed of them. Um, you know, in small doses, they're, they're useful and helpful. One of the things, that, so I think about praise a lot because it's, that's a more deceiving one, I think, sometimes than money. And I feel like it's really important to, this kind of hit home for me the other day, Never have something to prove, especially with your work, especially if you do uh, creative published work, I think, like I do with podcasts and writing. Never have something to prove, but something to confirm is probably okay. So despite, no matter, I know some very brave and courageous people who are very resistant to the opinions of the crowd and ch- chasing their own path, yet they, they reflect on, it's still powerful though when people reinforce you and tell you you're on the right track and believe in you, even if what you're doing seems crazy. And I think that is because no matter who you are, no matter how strong you are, it's always useful to have what your suspicion and your hypothesis is confirmed for what's good work from you. Uh, Whereas if you've got something to prove, you're looking too hard for the validation. So you'll start to get on a pleasure treadmill for praise, which is you'll only be motivated by the praise, but it won't last. You'll get in this game of chasing more and more of it because you get hooked on the praise and nothing else is fulfilling you and providing you assurance and and the whole thing will be very empty so you know and i've certainly i just think about that like you know money is definitely appealing to me if there's an opportunity to do something and it aligns with everything i care about and it's financially beneficial to me no problem that's what i think when i talked about mvo i've had you know i, I think i talked earlier about people like my dad joking about me like yeah you know you have a pretty decent life with the upbringing you've had to talk about minimum viable lifestyle. It's like, well, it's knowing the minimum is more of a psychological thing so that you're not pursuing money 
in an unhealthy way, disproportionate to its value. That's why I think a lot of invest financial uh, market, uh, public market investors, your Warren Buffetts and your Ray Dalios and Charlie Mungers, who I certainly look up to, um, and even from the startup world, like the Naval Ravikants and people like that, they have amazing kind of life principles and um, have very good perspectives and outlooks. And I probably think it's because this underlying trait, like the one, th the thing, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. My friend Marvin said to me once, Marvin Glass, and it's kind of like they're really good at spotting value and things that are overpriced and underpriced. And I think they're good at doing that in all areas of their life. Like, oh, this is not worthwhile for me. Like buying all this shit just because I made a lot of money is not worthwhile. Um, you know, investing is a fun game, so I'm going to invest time into that. And so I love, you know, I think all people should know a lot about investing for that reason. So not all extrinsic things are bad. They just have to be appropriate. So I think I made it clear the downsides in the last episode. Now we've brought it back a bit so you can rebuild maybe a healthier idea of them and you can reflect on what are the extrinsic rewards that are okay for you, all right? Attention is, is okay if you've deserved it because you're growing, you're, you're doing a genuine message. But remember what I said about primary incentive is super important and the primary in my opinion should always be intrinsic it doesn't mean that you have to have as long as that's the top one thing you care about most uh, you'll probably get through any of the extrinsic traps but we're going to talk about extrinsic traps next episode so if you want more uh, if you want to digest any of that insight in blog form you can google extrinsic traps and joe weeby or get to www.withjoeweeby.com uh, yeah, apart from that, as always, remember the best way to open a thousand doors for you is to concentrate on opening doors for others. You keep doing that, and then I'll come back with you, uh, for you with another podcast episode tomorrow.